Hey, Team Seafold, can you hear me? What about now? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. How's it going? I had a series of that one. On what? Uh, my PayPal contact. Your PayPal? Yeah. Um, Did they steal money? Yeah. I mean, no, they, 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 they took it from my bank to the PayPal and they paid it to the Oh, no. And I guess uh, like, I wasn't keeping tabs on my bank account, so I didn't catch it until like, this weekend. It was like four weeks ago. Two weeks ago, kind of. Oh, that's the other one. Yeah, I, I think uh, everything will work out, but I don't know. I'm in the middle of it. Can you do something? Yeah, I called them both and they like started, uh, what do you call it? I guess, I don't know if they're like investigations or. I don't know about what you are. Yeah. Or are they like, what are you going to do with that together? Like, what are you going to do with that? No, yeah, actually, it's more guaranteed that I'll get the refund that was actually. <laughs> That's kind of the thing that we do. That might be kind of the thing. Yes, the problem is it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a good time for you. I don't know if you have a good time for you. I don't know if you have a good time for you. I don't know if you have a good time for you. I don't know if you have a good time for you. I don't know if you have a good time for you. I don't know if you have a good time for you. I don't know if you have a good time for you. You can only pay for PayPal. So I guess like make an account and then send the money from your bank into PayPal. And then for people to be here for two sides. But uh, they're just accepting like kind of cards. Then you can't even get changed to your card because really I can use it. Or in no video for PayPal. Well, I was telling Michael that like years ago I worked for Uber. And uh, like after I stopped working for them, like just kind of like months later, I got an email that their data had been breached and they had like lost my information. So it's like out there for hackers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, sorry, scary. And it was from um, off because they hacked my uh, health insurance company. They stole up oh. everything. That was bad. I got all paid for one year of like exactly. protection. Exactly. That's what they offered like, me. Yeah, we're like, <laughs> where do you have to have the insurance? It's not like you owe them. Or like, yeah. It's not like they're storing your money. You just kind of like paying them for like emergency tickets. Well, they have, they have your social security number and things like that. Oh, like the information. And also the. The credit company, not the credit company, the, uh, how do you call it? The credit company? They keep credit or credit scores. Oh, really? uh, there's like three big ones. One of them got hacked. And they essentially got the information of like half of the population of the country, <laughs> <laughs> including mine. I, I got it like a letter. Like, oh, thank you. All right. Um, so, any questions about the homework? To do today or about other stuff? Okay. So, 
Uh, we're going to talk about um, particles that are indistinguishable and why that matters. So you see there the system of N um, non interacting. The wave function of this system can write it like this. So because the particles are non-interacting, then the wave functions of the independent particles are independent. So what will be a good example of a system of non-interacting particles? Mm -hmm. They interact. I mean, they have like, like a magnetic spin. They have a spin. Uh -huh. They have like a gas of electrons and neutrons. Like even if you don't have the electric charge. Okay. We're going to uh, yeah. Yeah, photons. So you can have like a a box with photons and they're going to interact. Uh, so this, this will be a good approximation. Uh, also, actually, um, solids, like you have your nuclei, your, your nucleus, and then you have all the electrons around. The electrons uh, don't interact. And that is the same thing uh, in, uh, in white waters. So you have a bunch of electrons. Uh, the wave functions don't like to interact. So, mm, yeah, I guess you have to you have to be a little bit more careful with the definition of interaction. So they do interact. Like if you look at them from outside, they do interact. But that interaction is because they don't interact. <laughs> so the wave functions don't like to be uh, entangled in any way. Yeah. Yeah. So what about um, uh, an ideal gas? Is it interacting particles? They don't, right? That's kind of the definition. They just have like these elastic collisions. Um, you, you know, we have the Uh, yield gas law. Can we modify it to make it, uh, uh, I guess, to parameterize interactions? Yeah. Yep. So, uh, the, I guess it would be the Van der Waals equation, right? So, we make a, um, correction to the pressure and to the volume. So they can modify that. So you know that's why we can sometimes study a gas of electrons or a gas of photons just like an, like an ideal gas. So, okay, so then this is the wave function of particle Xn. So does it matter? Let's consider the simpler case of um, just two particles, but it's going to hold in general.
does it matter if we uh, exchange the particles? So we flip X1 and X2. In our, let's say, for measuring it, then we have to take the square of these. Does it matter? Probably not. Let's, let's check it out. So, in order for this to be true, we have two options. We can do This is one option, and the other option is negative. Right. And because we had the square, then both of these are valid, I guess. So, what will be an example of uh, this case, in which the changing the particles doesn't change the wave function? be if the wave function is like this. And we have to these two points. We can switch them and we'll not notice anything. So this one will be be like that. So if we flip it, then we have to take the negative sign to make it equal. So this is the symmetric case. This is the anti-symmetric. So now, let's look at a scenario that is a little bit more complicated. So we have identical particles and even though we cannot distinguish between them, well, let's call them one and two, and we have uh, they occupy different states.
states A and B. So what, what can these uh, states be? Hmm? Could be an energy level. Positions. So for the time being, I want A and B to have the same energy. So you know, they are, one is not preferred over the other. So let's consider them positions, some spatial uh, states. So for the case in which particle one is in state A and two is in B, then let's call that the first case. The wave function particle one in state A or particle uh, and particle two in state B. The other situation is the vice versa uh, of this one. So two in state A, and one in state B. They have the same energy, so one is not too far over the other. Um, there's nothing that makes state one or two special um, or more likely over the other. So what is the true wave function of the system? According to Schrodinger. So the superposition of both, right? So one and two. So we can write that as Normalization. This is one option. Um, let's call it S for symmetric. And the other option is with a negative sign. So if we just measure it, so take the, um, the complex conjugate of these, then um, we get the same number, 
But if we look at the actual wave functions, we can have these deep waves. So now if we exchange x1 and x2, like we did before, Here. This one I'm going to make it a two, this one I'm going to make it a one, this one a one, and this one a two. So under exchange, we add them. And it is not zero. But in the other case, when this one is negative, um, it's one s. I mean, psi s. x1 is equal to um, x1, x2. Right, so this one is this term, this one is this term, so they are the same. But for the AS, this one is going to be a uh, negative. So it's going to be um, let's use this one because this one will switch it. So this will be the this metric. And then we switch the x2 and the x1. What do we get for the anti-symmetric case? Has to be like this. Is that oh no, it's fine. Look at confused. Sorry, this is too long. Okay, so this is what I was missing. Um, we are going to put both particles, one and two, in the same state. So for the symmetric case, That is greater than zero. And A. 
And then for the anti-symmetric, What's this? Zero. Okay, so what I want to show here is that from the math of Having indistinguishable particles that you can exchange. Um, if you try to put two indistinguishable particles in the same state, the probability of finding them in there is zero. But so same state. Anti-symmetric. And the probability, same state, but symmetric. something greater than zero. So this is called the Pauli exclusion principle. So if there is no way to, now let's say that A and B have different energy. So the energy of A is less than the energy of B. And you are at um, zero Kelvin. So the particles just collapse to their ground state. They have no energy to, to move around. In the case of the symmetric wave functions, both of them can occupy the same state. So they're, they're both going to go to, um, to A. But if the wave functions are anti-symmetric, then the ground state is one particle in A, lowest energy, and the next one, it cannot go uh, to where A is, into state A. So it has to remain in state B. So this energy uh, is What is the relationship between the energy and the wave function? Well, if the wavelength, if, if the frequency of the wave function is higher, then that is more energetic. Right? So it is it is something else so 
but, but th that is a very good question. So let me let me talk over that. So we cannot go to absolute zero because Heisenberg, right? Is in control of the mm -hmm. So um, you will always have some momentum, so some velocity, and then some kinetic energy. But this one, you know, think about the case of the infinite, infinite well. This is the Potential. This is made of, um, over here. Doesn't matter what it is over here. And you put your your particles in this potential. And you know the solutions. They have to be zero at the edges, and they are zero everywhere else. And then the next one, like that. Zero, zero. And then the next one. So that's zero, zero. Okay, so this is state A, B, and let's call this one C. So if the wave functions are symmetric, well, they can all go to state A and they are all going to have the same wave, wave function. But if they are anti-symmetric, then they have to be on top of each other, kind of like a ladder. So this is the ground state, this is the minimum energy. So at zero Kelvin, that is still gonna be the, the configuration. Mm -hmm. So you do have some kinetic energy but it's impossible for you to recover that kinetic energy right? because that is the minimum energy state of the system. Um, so, the, what we're going to be looking at in more detail is white dwarfs. So, this is kind of what you have for the white dwarfs. So, you know, they are radiating their additional. Uh, kinetic energy, but when they, you know, just go to absolute zero, the electrons are still going to have kinetic energy because of the Pauli uh, exclusion principle. So it's it's kind of a kind of a very interesting relationship. So this is also, you know, when we have volume. So you have your have your nucleus and then you have the electrons around and they cannot be in the same energy. They have to be more energetic. And so because they have more energy, you have your relationship with the position. So uh, if you had only symmetric functions, then th there will be no volume. It will not exist. Like you can have as many photons as you want in a box. They don't occupy any more. But you cannot have as many electrons as you want. So that's kind of cool. All right, so. So the, yeah, the math is fairly easy. Um, well, it just comes from the fact that these particles are indistinguishable. And this indistinguishability it, uh, doesn't depend on our instruments. Like, they are inherently indistinguishable. So, you know, that is another thing that you know, you know, blows my mind. So you have this white dwarf, right, that is say that it, it cooled down to its ground state. Um, 
you have some electrons that are moving uh, faster than others, well, they, they have to be um, you know, like in a ranking. But you cannot tell you know, which one is moving faster than the other. So it's just like this weird soup of something, <laughs> some quantum material. You cannot. Yeah. So you 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 call you call ex, you call exchange them, right? So you can say, oh, these these electrons are gonna move it to the higher energy, and this one is gonna move it down, and it will not change the system at all. And because this is just you know, it's pure quantum mechanics, the probability that you have, you know, each one is the same. So they're they're both there. You have the superposition. For these states, which is like, so that's that's why I like uh, white dwarfs. Okay, so you can only measure the square of the wave function. So that's the other ingredient of these. So we can have uh, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric. Um, yeah, so the probability of having Two anti-symmetric, two particles with anti-symmetric wave functions in the same state is rigorously zero. It's not like close to zero or approximately zero. It's like rigorously zero. So it cannot not be there. And you know, I was thinking about how to, I guess, prove this uh, indistinguishability. And this was the the best way that I was able to. Come up with it's like it's consistent with everything that we observed that you know if they have to be instinctual. I don't know, maybe someone can think of something else later, but it likely just comes from, from this fact that you can uh, that you can switch them. Okay, so for the particles that that have symmetric wave functions are called uh, bosons. And the anti-symmetric are fermions. And the other thing that makes them special to have um, I don't know if I should call it integral or integer integer spin. So spin equals zero, one, two, and this is um, a fraction spin. So this would be zero um, one half, three halves, zero. So spin is the quantum number, the inherent um, angular momentum. So they have, so these ones, They follow um, both Einstein um, statistics. So these ones are fairly derived. So, J 
just based on what we figure out about the anti-symmetric or fermions. If we want to know the number of particles as a function of the energy, how is that distribution going to look like? Goes up and down. Yeah. Mm. So imagine <laughs> about what? So why why is that the case though? You're thinking about the density of states. So how many uh, particles you can put in a state with the same energy. And because they change the other quantum numbers, you can have the same energy. You have S, P, D, F. But how many can you put in, uh, in each How do you call these the smaller ones, not the orbitals, but so like they, they look like lobes for the P electrons and then the other ones. Hmm? They're called orbitals, no? Yeah. So you have like the the EG and the T2G orbitals, like the electrons. And then for the P, I think you just have like PX, PY. Oh, this one's not like oh, this is the symmetry. So I call like B, X, Y, D, C, D, Y, Z. You may have like a square in there, right? So, anyways, the point is. Um, you can put two electrons in each orbital. And that's because you have the spin up and the spin down. But if you only consider the quantum number, you can put one per energy. So, the Uh, this distribution function is going to look like this. So you have one uh, fermion in each state where you can put it until the very end. That's the most energetic fermion. And you don't have anything after that. So, hmm? so for uh, for bosons because they can all collapse to the ground state. The, the ground state will be just, uh, like the, all your intensity will be at zero or at the lowest energy. But for fermions, we have to uh, you know, accommodate them. So, is it usually called the Fermi direct distribution?
just like that. So let's see what happens when the temperature goes to zero. And this energy, so this is uh, EF, and the energy is greater than the Fermi energy. So T goes to zero, and this one is going to be some positive number, right? So this goes to infinity, and it's going to be plus infinity. And then you have the plus one, and one over. So um, oh yeah, this is e to the infinity is infinity. Infinity plus one is infinity, and one over infinity is zero. And that's what you want. So the probability of at zero Kelvin, when going to the ground state, the probability of finding a fermion above the Fermi level is zero. So now let's see the other case. Probability of finding, so E minus EF, if, you, if you're on this side, it's gonna be negative, divided by, sorry, by zero. This is gonna be negative infinity. So then this is zero, one over one. This one. So the probability of finding a fermion below the Fermi level is one. You'll definitely find your fermion in there. So as you increase the temperature, then some of these fermions that are the highest energy state, they can move to a little bit over the Fermi energy. So you look like that. And you have very high temperatures, it will look like that. But um, in order for this to be significant, the temperature has to be pretty high. So in regular materials, the electrons are essentially in their ground state in, a, in the nucleus. And in, the, in, a, in a white dwarf, we will see that um, even though the temperature is high, the configuration is also very similar to this. So we can describe it um, as a degenerate Fermi gas. And degenerate means that it's very close to its ground state. So Examples of fermions, we have fractional speed. Leptons, which include the charge and the neutron. The charge are an electron. Neon, uh, 
Okay, just mute him, right? And this one is the neutral ones are going to be the neutrinos. So electron, neon, and tau. And also their antiparticles. So the positron, the anti tau, anti um, neon. So here the difference is the mass. Uh, this ones they have the same mass, the neutrinos. Uh, they change their flavor. So they change they switch between being electron, neon, and tau. And also quarks. So we have the up down the charm and strange and top and bottom. So so also kind of like this, so they are just like the more massive siblings. And then you have all the anti up, anti down, anti charm, all that good stuff. So if uh, neutrons or protons are made of quarks. Are neutrons and protons fermions or bosons? They are bosons? So you have three, and each of them has a spin of one half. They're going to be fermions. And one way to think about it, uh, do protons and neutrons have volume? Yeah. So if they have volume, they must be fermions. So just like you have you know, your configuration for the electronic structure in an atom, you have your configuration for um, the quark structure in the nucleus. So that's the other interesting thing about fermions and bosons. You can combine them and they behave. So if you look at helium-4, so it has two protons and two neutrons. So if you have two protons that spin uh, one half and one half, spin one, or I don't want to say spin one, but integer. And the neutrons, because you have two, both of them are fermions, it's going to be an integer. So helium-4, you know, in the, in the right, um, regime. So now, if you look at the quarks in the in the protons and neutrons, but if you look at helium four particles, then um, it is a boson. And some of the interesting things is that because the bosons can all occupy the same ground state, if you bring helium to a very low temperature, if helium-4, uh, what kind of effects do you have? Hmm? 
<laughs> Is that a pun? <laughs> uh, yes, it becomes a superfluid, which means that what? Yeah, there, there's no friction between the, the particles. That's because they are bosons. So they can all fall to the same ground state. So what if, what if you like, I don't know, if you don't want to, if you like switch between photons and pyramids, and you can like control them? Um, what's, do you repeat that? If you, if you, I don't know, like if you, so you, you, you just have to make this? Mm-hmm. I don't think so because they are like different spatial regimes. So, like the fermions are kind of at the same level, like the electrons are kind of at the same level as the quarks. And this is an effect that you can see when you have the whole nucleus. So probably not, but that would be really cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that sounds like the kind of experiment that someone would want to do, right? It's like you change a variable by a little bit and then it switches by completely the behavior that it has. So yeah, bosons and fermions, the two things that exist in universe. Uh, also, okay, last thing. Um, what's the last definition? Uh, baryonic, baryonic matter. So a, a baryon means that uh, it's made out of three quarks or three valence quarks. So protons and neutrons are baryons. And so neutrinos and electrons are not baryons but almost all of the matter in the universe, the mass, is baryonic. Because leptons are so, uh, so light. Okay. So, you know, let's think about it kind of as a box, but this can really be your, uh, your whiteboard. Um, and in this box, you have your, your energy states. So if you remember the uh, particle in a box, it has this one and then the next one will be this one. And you can have like all the different frequencies. And it is a box, so you have the same mechanism or I guess the same, I don't know what to call it methodology in every direction and they are pretty much independent. So we're gonna have E X, E Y, and E Z. So as you put your first electron in there, and it's gonna go to that and it's gonna have that energy for that uh, wave function. Uh, the next one that you put, you're going to have this one, and so on. So, 
I'm going to measure uh, that is with the uh, wave vector. So if we want to add all the energies in there, I guess we want to know how many um, electrons or how many fermions we have in the box. We can get it So as you put more and more uh, electrons in there, the separation between the states becomes smaller and smaller, so the sum uh, becomes uh, an integral. And L is going to be the type of the box. And uh, the Fermi uh, wave vector is the wave vector of the most energetic um, electron or fermion. So if you do this, you can count all of them, and this is in two dimensions. You have your D3K. The number of electrons or the number of fermions in this, in this box. And this one, you, know, you can do it as a sphere. I guess it's a volume. So you can do the four, five, um, EK. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have another K because this is in the months. So the number of states oops, it's going to be um, and for uh, electrons, you can put two in each state. So spin up and spin down. So then this is going to be eight pi. And then this L cube is a volume. And then this is we have another eight another pi cube over there. You can get rid of it. Squared. And then you have k squared dk from zero to kf. This is volume over i squared. This is just Uh, Kf, no, K, yeah, Kf cube divided by K. So from this, we can get that Kf from the wave vector cube is. Of particles divided by the volume is your uh, particle density. Mm 
So the Fermi vector is going to be that. So this tells you what is the energy of the most energetic um, electron, which is a function only of the density. So the wave vector is two pi over um, k in this case Fermi wave vector. So n So the separation between the particles is going to go as the number density to the negative one there. Okay, so now energy is the momentum uh, over to m so that's h bar k squared over to m so the fermi energy it's going to be h bar square Fermi wave vector square over q n. So if you have electrons, this will be the mass of the electron. So this is just the energy of the most energetic electron in your system. So we can put these um, value for the Fermi wave vector. So based on the density, number density of the system of the white dwarf, you can know what is the energy of the most energetic electron. And the other thing so we're gonna use this next class to get the relationship between the mass and the radius. The total energy, the internal energy of the system
So this one is the energy of as a function of the wave vector. And this is the number. This gives you your total energy. So if you do what the algebra there, get h squared h bar squared volume. pi squared mass uh, from the wave vector to the peak of the pi. So the volume This is the number density. So you can put it, you can put one in there, three thirds, and then the other one inside, the other two, I guess. To get rid of the volumes and then the times and this is going to be three fifths of the number of particles. Bar KF squared over 2M. And this one is just the Fermi energy. So why is it different than and if you do this? So the energy over here increases with each particle. So it's going to be the limit Why is the total energy not just EF times M. This is angel over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? Okay, yes. <laughs> Wait, so I was so getting confused. Is that a total energy equation? 
Yes. Did you just get rid of the big one? Yeah, so if you move it over here. Right, so that's what I have for you today. So no comments about the homework? You haven't looked at it? I looked at it. Okay. Um, I uploaded your video, right, Ramon? Sure. To your, your uh, mini research project? Did I, did I reply to you? <laughs> okay, for those who have not, just send me an email allowing me to upload the, the presentation. Uh, I uploaded yours, I forgot. Um, I think yours, okay. Yeah, and I, I gave um, collaboration points, but if I have not replied, if I have not told you that I gave collaboration points, then I haven't. So please send me an email about that. Yes. So please do that right now if you can. Um, let's see. So you recorded the discussion for the. Mm -hmm. For the forum discussion, that was that's pretty good. I think the the time was appropriate. We tried to actually aim for five minutes, and I think we did. So, did you discuss that before and then record yeah, it? Yeah, we've been discussing it for like an hour. Yeah, the video was like almost two hours long. But that's also because. Sometimes each of us like will focus on one detail, but like we really don't need to that much. So it is it is up to you how far time is you're not satisfied with it, so we're not really satisfied. Did you like the paper? Yeah. Okay. I think the next one is on proto stars. Most of the papers are really awesome. I mean I think well, I think the ones at the beginning were a little bit, you know, they were more mathematical. And I'm aiming for like better explanations. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next time we're going to get the trend to say car radius. Um, sorry, the mass uh, from the polytropes. So if you, I guess in thermo, we try to derive the relationship between the mass and the radius of the white dwarf, and I guess we did. But it assumes things like uh, the gravitational potential energy was three fifths of uh, GM over R squared, which we know is not quite the case if it's not uh, uniform density. So, the polytropes is how actually Shannon Saker got it. All right, everybody, thank you. So I just checked and didn't upload my video. You didn't? Yeah.